Did you know that um, South Africa um, is one of the world's biggest producers of macadamia nuts, as well as moringa seeds? These are some of the world's most powerful um, health-enhancing nuts, uh, health-enhancing plants, health-enhancing seeds. Um, and South Africa happens to be one of the world's biggest producers. My name is Amrindeni Mafumo. I was born in Nimbabwe province, in a former homeland of Venda. Um, I want you to, many of you might, 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 might have an idea of, of sort of how, how Venda looks like. So I want you to, to picture um, how Venda looks like how Venda looked like about 30 or 35 years ago, when I was born. The biggest memory of my childhood has always been my grandmother waking up in the morning, um, going to collect water, waking up after that, going to the small garden that, that uh, you know, the shared um, agricultural spaces that she used to work in. Um, the image has always been that of um, women, mostly old women, and young girls waking up in the morning collecting water, so the image that you can picture in your head is always those cans. It's always, it's generally, it's usually those white or yellow cans. And that's become an archetype of Africa. Uh, many of us that, when you see images of the African continent, when you see images of even Venda, where I come from, that's been the archetype. It's always been women carrying water and water being a, a huge part of, of society. I was fascinated by this. I was really fascinated by how, how these old women would have a big yard, would have a big agricultural uh, space within their community. And another image of Venda that many of you would know, even if you go on Google, is that Venda is one of the greenest places that you would, um, you would find in South Africa. They call it Africa's Eden. So every village, it's self-sustaining. Every village, we, I mean, for, for the longest of times, um, every single thing that we were eating at my house we were farming it. Every single thing that, and we would share amongst, so they would share the seeds amongst each other, would share um, you know, the, 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 some of the fruits that were not growing in your yard, some of the vegetables that you couldn't grow would share amongst each other. So it was very much a very self-sustaining um, community. And that's the image that I want you guys to have of, of our communities. That's the image that we, most of us would have of where we grew up. That's become an archetype of the African image, right? From a very young age, those were some of, the biggest, some of my biggest fascinations. And my second biggest fascination has always been things. There's always been things that move. So it has always been cars, it's always been trucks that I was seeing, it's always been um, you know, lights that I would see from, from a distance. Um, it's always been, it's always been the, it's a stove that, are, that, that we had. Um, so I was really fascinated by how these things functioned, how these things worked. So with very little research, I decided I want to be a scientist. I want to, I want to invent things, I want to invent things that move, I want to invent things that, um, that people use for, for all sorts of things. So with very little research, I went in and I studied science, I went in and I studied chemistry. I'm, a, I'm one of those people that, that, that truly, truly loved um, the idea of getting up in the morning, putting on a white coat, uh, putting on goggles, and doing stuff in the lab. In high school, we, that's, that, has, that has always been my biggest fascination. And that's because one time my mother made a mistake of buying a book, a set of books called Young Scientist, which turned a little kitchen into a science laboratory. So this is the image of a person. So first of all, you imagine where the area that I grew up in. Second of all, you imagine the passion and the things that I was really, really interested in. And third of all, now I find myself in Cape Town studying chemistry. So I found myself working in the water space. I found myself working in the research in water space. Uh, one of the biggest, um, one of the best projects that I worked on was in the, at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, where these guys were treating industrial water using sunflowers. That was fascinating. That was really, really exciting. So with that little bit of a research, I went and I interviewed for a job by the city of Cape Town, water and sanitation. Um, th 2006, 2007, the city of Cape Town was facing the situation that it's facing exactly this year that of water shortage. So our job was to ensure that for the three, four million citizens of Cape Town would open their taps and have water. It was a nice job to have. It wasn't an easy job, as you can tell. We didn't do, you know, as you can tell how, how much of a job we did. I, I spent four years in the city of Cape Town. After that, I went and spent four years in the city of Johannesburg, where I was working at Joburg Water, doing a very similar role. But one thing that really, really struck me was communities, was how communities were built. 
In Cape Town, there was a community of Pinelands, an affluent, beautiful area. Literally across the road was a community of Langa. The things that I was working on at the moment was water. Um, the things that I was working on were drinking water. And I was using my research, I was using my skills to ensure that three million people within this city have access to drinking water. But one thing I was noticing was that in Delft, just across the road, people didn't wake up in the morning and get tap water. So many of you would wake up in the morning, where does your water come from? From your tap. But that was not the reality for many people. In Johannesburg, it's exactly the same thing. I stay in a suburb called Four Ways. Literally across the street from Four Ways, it's an informal settlement called Dipsluit. Um, you'll see in the presentation right towards the end how the, the situation is like when it comes to access to drinking water. So I was working, I was giving all this knowledge and the, science, the skills that I developed to ensure that the people in Four Ways wake up in the morning, open their tabs, and they can wash their Ferrari. While people in Dipsluit couldn't have a single drop of water, such a stage that sometimes they'd even have to buy water. So I decided, you know what, let me, do, let me, do, let me study a little bit more to see just how deep this problem is. And it's, 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 it's quite a big problem. Globally, over a billion people lack access to safe drinking water. And majority of those are people in rural and informal settlements in the African con con continent. Every 90 seconds, four babies die due to drinking contaminated water or inadequate sanitation. But what's even more striking is that in the, in the, in the continent, in the developing world, 50% of all water projects fail within the first two to three years. So we've got this massive problem, we've got this massive budgets that come from the US and, the, and Europe, but 50% of all those projects fail within the first two to three years. So we try to look at what are some of the problems, what are the, some of the reasons why this is such a problem. So I looked in the context of South Africa and I tried to think about why is South Africa having such a problem when it comes to something as basic as drinking water? Such a developed country. So when I think back, so now I want to transport you back to my community. After having spent about 20 something years in my community, about 18 years in my community, coming back with the dawn of democracy, nothing had changed. Women would still wake up in the morning, carry their water in the, in the head, go, uh, carry the buckets in the head, go collect water from the river. And I found out that over 400 million hours are spent by mostly women and girls collecting water annually. So some of the reasons why, some of the biggest reasons why this, this, this problem exists, especially in South Africa. Number one is that South Africa is a dry country. We all know that. South Africa is one of the world's driest countries. Number two is the way that we collect water. It's the way that we treat water. It's the way that we distribute water, which is a very centralized system. So think about it. In South Africa, rain has to come down. After rain comes down, gets treated through a natural treatment process, through some chlorination, through um, a dam, some sort of a dam system, through um, storage in some, some form of a reservoir or water towers, and into your tap to wash your Ferrari. That's a flawed system. Because one, that's an expensive system. Water mostly is collected in the highlands, or water is collected mostly in the Sutu, as most of you would know. Water is collected in the Val. Johannesburg as a city is one of the only cities in the world that's not built in, the, in a river system. So to collect that, 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 that water is, costs a lot of money. Currently, it's estimated to be a trillion rands. Number two, it's, it's scientists are saying that in the, by the year 2030, global rain, a rain in South Africa, would have dropped by an average of 50%. So, to start with, we won't even have any rain to work with. It's a huge problem. So we've got an issue of South Africa being a dry country. We've got an issue of rain due to climate change drying up. And thirdly, we've got an issue of huge infrastructure spend that needs to be spent to build, uh, to build water purification systems. Meaning that the communities in Deep Sluit would forever stay without water. And that's generally because, one, you can't map you can't map an informal settlement. So you can't put infrastructure in an informal settlement because it keeps moving. So 
what are we doing about this? What's our idea? What's, what's the point of me talking about this? So as a scientist and as people, we need to find the best ways of ensuring that, one, we find the cheapest way of treating water. The cheapest way of treating water and reducing the burden of infrastructure's costs on rural and as well as informal settlements. That's the first thing. Number two, we have to find alternative ways of material that we use in order to treat water. So back to my opening statement. South Africa is one of the biggest producers of macadamia nuts and moringa seeds. So guess what? In my organization at Kusini Water, we've built a water purification system that uses macadamia nut shells as well as moringa seeds. So some of you might not be familiar with macadamia nut. Macadamia nuts are those brown, thick, thick, um, thick skinned nuts. So they grow from a, from a plant, it's a macadamia plant. After, it become, after from a plant, it is a flower, it becomes a nut which is normally green. After that, it's brown, and then it's ready to be harvested. So the farmer generally harvests it. They take, they smash the nuts, the shells from the nuts. So they separate the shells, put them aside, and they usually sell the, the nuts themselves. The shells are usually waste. So what are we doing? We take the waste shells and we convert that into a filter. That filter is solar powered. That filter uses macadamia nuts, moringa seeds, all of the stuff that the good stuff that we have locally. So what does this mean? What does this actually mean for the year 2030? What does this actually mean for you and I? What does this mean for the communities that you're going to be living in in the next 10 years, the communities that you're going to be living in in the next 20 years? Are we thinking about the water that we have every morning? Because guess what? It's drying up. We might all be sitting here thinking, I don't worry about water. I wake up in the morning, I open my tap and there's water. Guess what? By 2030, we're going to have the same problem that we had with electricity in South Africa. So maybe you might not be able to wake up in the morning, open your tap, and wash your Ferrari. So I want you to think about the community of Miruwan. So what we are doing at Kusini Water is that we're taking away the entire burden. So think about it this way. What the, what the idea that we have, the, the, the solution that we have, works similar to a cell phone signal tower. So remember in the past how we used to communicate using telephones. So there would be this massive landline infrastructure that comes in, and then it all gets connected through wires into your own home. Now cell phone towers, they come and revolutionize that. So what cell phone towers do is that they come in, one tower in each community, and that tower communicates with other towers that are around it. Right, to communicate with the device that you have in your pocket. So now we don't all have to be connected using wires in our pockets. So Kusini Water is doing the same thing when it comes to water. So we're taking each community, so imagine the community of Miruwan. The community of Miruwan is a, is a beautiful community in, a, in, 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 in rural Venda. For years, the community of Miruwan hasn't had water. But guess what? The community of Miruwan has a beautiful aquifer. The community of Milwani has a beautiful spring. So what Kusini Water does is that we come in with our remote system. So this is a, this is a small system that we've built using, using solar power. It's an off-grid system, so it comes in into the community just like a cell phone signal tower, and we treat water right there in Milwani, and we distribute water right there in Milwani. That, as the community shifts, as the community moves, is able to adapt to the community. We're able to use the Internet of Things and we sit in our head office and we're able to monitor how much water has been consumed. We're able to monitor the quality of the water and that has been consumed. We're able to, 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 to program the system in such a way that it serves directly the people of Miruwan. The same can be said for a community, for most communities that are now emerging in KZN. And these are communities that are using seawater here as a local source of water. So we come in and we treat a coastal, the coastal town we come in and treat seawater, just like a normal, a normal off-grid system, treat seawater, the seawater gets distributed as drinking water, and all, the, and, 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 and all the, the reused waste gets used for smallhold farming. So this is just a small idea from a small company. Imagine if all of us in our own homes were getting off the water grid, 
Imagine if all of us in our own homes were putting in rainwater harvesting tanks. Imagine if all of us were starting to think that our water is not coming from our, tap, our taps. Imagine the possibilities. Thank you.